Coming up on DTNS, French digital tax compromise, the new number two in smart speakers, and the most annoying thing about the iPhone reveal. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 26, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Yes, I am back uh, from two weeks uh, of doing Sword and Laser in Ireland, uh, covering Worldcon, and and just uh, taking a little break in France. If you want to hear more about that, of course, Good Day Internet, our expanded show, is full of my praises for my Irish tour guide, uh, and hopefully some other things uh, as well. So go check that out at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know on the NASA officially opened the Aitken supercomputer at the Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, capable of 3.69 petaflops of theoretical performance. Aitken uses 46,080 second-gen Intel Xeon cores and 221 terabytes of storage. Aitken uses, uh, uses a modular design to save energy and easily expand compute or data storage capabilities, supporting up to 16 additional modules. An earlier prototype was able to save 2 million kilowatt hours of power and over 3 million gallons of water in 2018 using a similar design. The supercomputer will first get to work modeling and simulating the entry, descent, and landing to the moon for the Artemis project. Oh, cool. I'm looking forward to that. NVIDIA and VMware announced a partnership to let virtualization of GPUs on-premise or in the cloud using VMware Cloud on AWS. NVIDIA's vCompute server will provide the virtualization framework and is optimized to run on VMware's vSphere. This will, or do you say vSphere? Uh, this will allow a single GPU to be shared by multiple users, as well as aggregate GPUs for larger techs. F compute server will support NVIDIA's data processing and machine learning libraries called Rapids, as well as containerized applications. All right, let's talk a little bit about that French digital tax piece. Yes, French President Emmanuel Macron. Yes, just, you well. know. Yes, my French. Yeah, see, Tom gets it. He was in France recently. Sure, uh, announced yeah. that he and U.S. President Donald Trump have agreed on a compromise regarding French taxation of tech companies. So essentially, France will continue with its current plans to tax tech companies under a new Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, framework, which they agreed will happen next year. The framework is meant to tax companies based on where they operate, not where they're headquartered. The current French plan requires that marketplace and advertising companies that generate more than 750 million euros in global revenue and 25 million euros in France to pay 3% of French revenue in taxes. That impacts mostly U.S. tech companies. Tax paid under this French scheme before the OECD framework is implemented will be used as credits for the OECD plan and any overpayments will be refunded. So, okay. Uh, what's actually going on, and then what 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 it means? If you didn't quite follow that, uh, maybe maybe a short way of explaining it is: France wants to have a, a law that taxes companies that otherwise avoid tax in France by headquartering themselves, say, in Dublin. A lot of companies do that uh, and say, oh, well, all of our taxes are under Ireland, which Ireland has a lower tax rate. So France is trying to say, hey, if you're making a lot of money, you're making a lot of revenue in France, we should get a cut of that. Uh, that, of course, angered the United States, who said, yeah, but the way you wrote this law pretty much targets U.S. companies. And so what Macron said here was, okay, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, has been working on a framework to kind of get rid of this loophole Europe-wide. So why don't we do this? Uh, we will implement our version of this. And when the OECD comes in with their version, which everybody is going to have a say in, then we'll basically retroactively apply it. And if companies had paid more under our scheme, we'll give them money back. Otherwise, we'll credit it towards their OECD taxes. Now, whether the U.S. actually has said, great, that's cool, uh, then we don't have a problem with that, is somewhat unclear. But it seems to at least be the hope of France. Yeah, I mean, I completely understand where the French government is coming from on this. Uh, it, it, In many ways, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, okay, you can headquarter wherever you are, but if there's enough operation happening in our country... There's some taxes that that have to be implemented, um, and yeah, it sounds like um, people are playing nice with this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a loophole that yeah. companies legally exploit to say, oh, we want a headquarter in the European Union. Ireland has a lower tax rate. We'll put our office in Dublin, and then we'll 
uh, have all the revenue go through there on the books so that we get the lowest tax rate. Why you would do the same thing, right? Sure. Yeah. But if you're what allowed you're to. to do is say, Hey, you know what? Let's change the rules so that they can't use that. that loophole. Uh, Chromebooks are getting serious about the workplace. Dell unveiled the latitude. That's right. The good old workhorse horse Dell latitude now has a Chromebook edition, the latitude 5,400 Chromebook enterprise and the latitude 5,300 two in one Chromebook Enterprise. So one's a two and one, one's not. Uh, they're both available in 13 and 14 inch screens. Both laptops offer eighth gen Intel processors up to a Core i7 and uh, claim to be the first Chromebooks to offer up to 32 gigabytes of RAM. So pretty specced out like a normal latitude, just running Chrome. Both include enterprise grade SSDs up to a terabyte, uh, optional LTE connectivity, USB-C docking. And the biggest advantage if you're an IT professional deciding whether to buy a fleet of these for your, for your business is 24-7 Dell Cup Pro support, uh, Google's Chrome Enterprise support, Google Admin Console for managing Linux environments so you can deploy these easier and faster. The Latitude 5400 starts at 699 bucks, and the 5300 2-in-1 starts at $819, both available starting August 27th. I really like these specs. In fact, they are very similar to my most recent purchase, which is a Mac Mini, which was a whole lot more expensive than these Chromebooks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, I don't know. The knock against it is like, eh, they're not real pretty looking. They're they're just kind of gray Dell laptops. Yeah. But the innards are pretty pretty nice. Good prices. They are not uglier than any other Dell Latitude, as far as I can tell. Uh, but yeah, they, these are these are enterprise books. They're they're meant to not annoy any purchase manager anywhere with how they look uh, and and look professional. Um, and and they're spec'd well, so so they'll be powerful enough to stick around for a while. I think that's one of the biggest uh, concerns when you're when you're rolling out these in the enterprise is we don't want to have to upgrade these in a year. So you want to have 32 gigabytes of RAM as a potential uh, option here. You you want to have a lot of this stuff, you know. And this is Google trying to take a bite out of Microsoft's market. It'll be interesting to see how Microsoft responds with its more limited version of Windows that, is, that has been going after Chrome uh, and whether they'll make any price deals. But expect to see Google have similar announcements soon with HP, Lenovo, et cetera, because they really want to move from being considered to be the education market, which is what, how a lot of people think of Chrome OS, to also be an option in the enterprise market. I will be curious to see how many two-in-ones uh, go to the enterprise versus the 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 less expensive 5400 the 5300 is the two and one mm -hmm. and how much more in a workplace environment uh employees will be like the two and one come on for meetings please you got to give me that one yeah i feel like I, I don't know this is one i'd like to hear people uh weigh in on feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com but i feel like sales people can often make that like well i need to be able to you know manipulate mm -hmm. it and be able to show off presentations with it easier so yeah uh yeah that's a good question Canalys estimates that Baidu is now the world's number two vendor of smart speakers. Baidu claimed 17.3% of the worldwide market, despite only selling in China with 4.5 million shipments in Q2 of this year. Google shipped 4.3 million units and fell to third. Baidu's basic speakers start as low as 89 won, which is about 12 US dollars. Canalys attributed Google's fall in the rankings to the change to Nest branding and a focus on smart displays over smart speakers. Amazon still leads the world with a 25% share of the total market, shipping 6.6 .6 million units. The global market grew 55.4% to 26.1 million units in Q2, although it did decline 2.4% in the US. Mm, so there's lots of interesting things to pick apart here. Uh, one, Baidu uh, coming in at an aggressive price point in China at 89 yuan and just toppling Alibaba. Uh, Alibaba was the top smart speaker maker in China. And they, they aren't even mentioned in, in most of the stories about this because Baidu just put them to the dust and became the number two globally while only selling in China. Second interesting thing of this story is Google, which sells everywhere but China, uh, having a lot of branding confusion with the change to Nest, focusing on displays, which people are already a little creeped out by smart speakers, adding a display sometimes with a camera makes people even more creeped out. It sounds like there's been some muddled messaging hurting Google in this space. Amazon, not hurt by that, running away with it uh, as the worldwide leader, except in the US though, and that's the third thing I find interesting, 
where the market declined in the U.S. and the U.S. is where you're getting all these scare stories about people listening to your conversations. I mean, I guess you get them in Europe too, but maybe that market just hadn't grown enough to, to show that kind of decline. Yeah, I don't think we're at the, well, everybody has a smart speaker plateau point no. yet. The decline definitely has to do with probably some bad press, uh, a little bit of market confusion. But yeah, I mean, Baidu sort of coming out of almost smart speaker obscurity in China alone just goes to show you not only, you know, if you price something attractively enough, people will buy it and how strong the home market is to yeah. to 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 surpass Google's global, global uh, pretty much everywhere in the whole world besides China, you get a Google smart speaker. So I mean, granted, it Google is Home isn't available in every single market worldwide, but it's in, it available Men. in a lot of very large markets. So, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and granted, China, a huge market. So it, it's it's not impossible for to do what Baidu did, but it's significant that it did it. And I think it's really interesting to see that. And and as I've said before, this is, this is a, a story about transparency when we have these things about like, oh, they're listening to you. They should have told you that there is a very small chance that your recording could be listened to by someone. Uh, and because they didn't, they opened themselves up to these scare stories that make it feel like, oh, they're listening to everything you say, uh, which is how a lot of people perceive these stories. When 0.2% of recordings even get forwarded, most of those recordings are very mundane things, uh, but you have a couple of salacious items in there and that makes a good headline, creeps everybody else out, and then your market declines by 2.4%. I wonder how much the Nest branding really confused people to the point where they're like, well, I want a Google home speaker, not a Nest. I mean, well, all of that would be pointed to by Google. I think if you're if you're unaware of many of many of the differences, and if you're not creeped out, and you go into the store and you're like, okay, I heard there's Google and there's Amazon, and you go up to the shelf and you're like, wait, that one's called Nest. Is that Google? I mean, it has a Google logo, but this one's called Amazon. I'll just get that one. Yeah. Right? It's it just it causes enough friction that it it doesn't stop people. It's not like they sold zero, right? But right. it might slow some people down. Uh, also taking part in the G7 meetings in France was Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison announcing his government will seek to create a framework to block domains that host extremist material. So this is they want to do a thing to do a thing. A 24-7 crisis coordination center would be set up to monitor the Internet and look for extremist content. Australia's e-safety commissioner would then be in charge of determining on a case-by-case -case basis whether material should be blocked or not. Specific criteria have yet to be determined, but they'll know it when they see it, I bet. A commissioner will work with companies to be able to block the content quickly during an attack. So they need to set up a thing, they need to define a thing, and then they need to figure out how to get the tech companies to do the thing, right? Whether it's the telcos blocking the domain or if it's particular sites like YouTube or Facebook removing stuff. Uh, large tech companies and telcos, therefore, have until the end of September to tell the government how they'll cooperate with the scheme. Uh, now that they've told them they wanna do this vague thing, it's on the tech companies and the telcos to tell them how to do it. The Australian government is also considering legislation to force tech companies to improve overall safety. That's even a little farther in the offing. Okay. So first thing, it sounds like this is all a great idea. You know, the government's like, we shouldn't have to see this stuff is, you know, it's, it's hurting our community. The tech companies need to be on board, but we don't exactly know how to implement this. So at the end of September, tech companies come to us and let us know what you're going to do to help us meet our initiative. Yeah, I feel like this is the worst example of government by press release. Uh, you're taking a very specific example uh, and a very horrible example, and I don't mean to minimize that with the, what happened in Christchurch. And you're saying, let's create an entire system based on making sure that you don't have live streaming like that again. And that's just going to lead to disappointment because that is not what's going to happen again. Uh, and you don't really, it's very clear to me that they don't really know what they're looking for and how to stop it. They just want to make it look like they're doing something to stop a horrible thing from happening. Uh, and so while I laud the goal of saying, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we, we should not have a world in which someone can live stream themselves killing people, uh, I'm not sure this is the best way to achieve that goal. Well, yeah. I mean, and if you if if you go, you know, a little bit further with what the government also wants to do, which is introduce legislation to force 
a Facebook Live to not exist, for example, because it's sort of like, okay, well, how do, how does that, how, how do we make sure that something like that doesn't happen? Well, the tool would have to not exist. And the tool would have to not exist on lots of other platforms where they also exist. So that is, I mean, that's a, that is, that would be a big turnaround for how the world works right now. Yeah, I'm more and more of of the uh, of the opinion that that's an, an area worth investigating is the fact that companies don't curate more uh, because they don't for for multiple reasons they don't curate more. Some of them think that the algorithm is better. Some of them know that the algorithm brings more streams and they just can't get off that. You know, they just can't let go of that that huge num amount of traffic. Uh, and some of them just purely believe that, you know, curation is is picking a winner and they, they don't want to be in that position. But I am more and more of the belief that that some kind of human curation would solve a lot of YouTube's problems right away. And their resistance to it is actually making things worse, uh, not making things better. And that is an area to investigate. See if I'm right. My, see if my instincts bear something out. Uh, but but also figure out how to actually change things to disincentivize bad content from being picked up and spread. Well, if you've ever wondered why things show up at the top of search results, I've got an interesting story for you. Let's all scratch our heads on this. Monday, the Google Webmaster's Twitter account responded to a post from July 29th by Suhask93, that's the Twitter handle, that asked if referral traffic was considered as a ranking factor in search. The response read, Hi, Suhas. No, traffic to a website isn't a ranking factor. If you're starting to get relevant traffic and users love your site, that's a good start, though. Now, on the seroundtable.com website, which talks a lot about SEO, re readers have joined in with a range of skepticism about this <laughs> response from cogent theories on what Google actually might be doing, like monitoring backlinks, and then a lot of sarcastic posts like, websites themselves, not a ranking factor. Yeah, I, yeah I don't, this caught my eye today because... I, I think maybe um, uh, uh, privileging some sites or, or incorporating the idea that sites get a lot of traffic uh, would improve search results because then you wouldn't have these gamified sites that, that have zero visitors uh, otherwise showing up at the top of search results. I, I think sometimes when you're looking for things on Google, it's a mess. Uh, it's worse than it was in the early days because there's all these sites you have to wade through go, no, that's just SEO. That's just gaming the system. Okay, here's the actual thing. So I feel like Google really has to take that into account somehow. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I think it's I'd weird be... too that this post happened about a month after the original question, but maybe they're just, you know, getting, getting through the backlog. Who knows? It would be nice, and this is, you know, I'm I'm suggesting something that I'm sure Google has uh, would would not want to implement. But it would be nice if, you know, that there's websites where it's like the common misspelling, and they end up getting a lot of traffic because just yeah, yeah. Uh, someone's going too quick or whatever. Right. It would be nice if Google could somehow have some sort of a you know a blacklist of like commonly identified misspelled websites and give you a little pop up that was like, did you mean to go here? And the more they times people that. say they no, 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 no. They do that sometimes. It's just that that the, I haven't seen that in a while. The websites stay ahead of it so so easily. Yeah. yeah. I mean, granted, there's a lot of downsides to saying like, oh, if you get more traffic, you get higher SEO. That that lets that lets the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. I I, I wouldn't say as simple as just give higher results to the most trafficked websites, but I do think it's a valuable piece of data that they sh should be taking into account. Yes. You know, and balancing it out with a lot of other factors. So they don't want to appear to be making the rich richer. That's, I think that's what that's about. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Do it now. We're back. CNET's Patrick Holland posted an impassioned plea Sunday titled, Apple needs to fix the iPhone 11's buttons so accidental screenshots go away. His, his, his overall column is, is full of a lot of things he yearns for, including a stylus. He has some Note 10 Envy, uh, USB-C, uh, inbox Bluetooth headphones, the ability to use the back of an iPhone as a wireless charger. But the one that seems to have struck the chord is when he writes, the volume buttons don't need to be directly across the screen from the power button. Seriously, I take so many accidental screenshots. My gallery is full of images of my lock screen. Stagger the buttons so there's room to put a finger for the extra leverage I occasionally need to change the volume. 
Android fans, you could take a breather and chuckle right now. But for us iPhone users, Sarah, this is a, this is a regular source of pain. Oh, it is. Keep dreaming about those inbox Bluetooth speakers uh, or headphones, rather, Patrick. Uh, that's not happening. But <laughs> it's funny. I actually have the opposite problem of Patrick because I take a lot of screenshots, sometimes because I want to take a screenshot and sometimes because my eyes are bad and I take screenshots so I can read things that are too small. I take a lot of screenshots and I'm constantly using the volume down button by accident instead of the volume up button. And everybody knows that that just makes my screen go to sleep. So then I have to like open up my phone again and then take the screenshot with it. It's, it's mildly annoying, mild inconvenience, but drives me up the wall. And I agree that the buttons, you know, yes, you feel them and you know what everything does. And yet I am constantly making mistakes. And that's not my only gripe uh, with my current iPhone because more than once now, I have dialed 911 and successfully gotten through to a dispatcher while I was jogging with my phone safely in a snug fanny pack, nowhere uh, near me trying to like SOS anybody. And it just got squeezed in the in the pack? Yeah. And you know, sometimes, uh, well, you know, my flashlight will be on when I take my phone out of my bag. You know, I'm like, why is the mm. flashlight on? You know, because you can do that while it's locked. You can... Take photos while it's locked as well. But I also, again, mild annoyance, you know, the volume will get, it will hit something. So I'm listening to a podcast and I'm kind of like, why is the, why is the volume's going away? And, you know, sometimes I, I can do it from my Bluetooth wireless um, earbuds. And sometimes I got to rummage through a purse or, or what have you. But, but the calling 911 thing is like, I mean, I am mortified and I do not want to waste a, a 911 dispatcher's time. And I absolutely didn't mean to do it, but I yeah. was simply running. I have done the 911 thing. I, I generally notice it before uh, it becomes a problem, mm -hmm. but it, I, it's usually when I've like, I, it's when I'm jogging too, and I take the phone out and I'm holding it because I maybe I want to change a, a podcast, uh, I change my mind, or I'm like, oh, you know what? I want to listen to a baseball game right now. And I'm holding it and I'm I'm waiting for a good moment to stop and do that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and suddenly I'm hearing and the first time you hear that noise for no, for somebody who hasn't, yeah, maybe you've done it on purpose. Yeah. You actually yeah, called that alarm. Button. What? Yeah. Yeah. The first time I was like, well, that's a kind of an aggro ringtone someone has around me. And then I was like, I think it's me. Oh, it must be an Amber yeah. alert. Oh gosh. I'm calling 911. You know, and <laughs> I, I've, like, I've been lucky enough to be able to catch it before it ever got uh, picked up, but yeah, I'm sure they, they get it a lot. Um, if there's any 911 dispatchers in the audience, let us know if that annoys you or relieves you that it wasn't in fact an emergency maybe yeah, and, if it, and if it's a rampant problem yeah. uh, because the first time it happened i went well that was embarrassing you know and then the second time i was like this is a problem you know this is this is a user interface problem that's like above and beyond like hey i wish the buttons were staggered a little bit better but i, used to, but I do hear that you know the button issue is 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 another one i used to take screen screenshots of audible all the time because i had this weird thing with my headphones where I would press pause and then they wouldn't come off pause, right? I'd do the tap on the earphones to press pause and they wouldn't mm. come off pause. Um, and, and so I would take the phone out and as I'm reaching in and taking it out, I would accidentally take a screenshot. So, uh, I mean, I definitely, I definitely had that problem for a long time. The, the earbuds don't seem to do that anymore. They don't seem to lose it. But on my recent vacation, as you can see, I was uh, taking the 10 line to the eight line uh, while holding my phone running to the train stop. I made sure that I took a screenshot uh, <laughs> and there's a couple of pictures and then, oh, look there, I did, I did it again. So yeah, it happened to me just on this most recent trip. Well, Rob, you're, you're an Android user. I, we, they, do you have anything like this? Do you have any uh, versions of this that happened to you on Android? Uh, kind of, but you can change like even, even in, in the in Android OS, you can tweak some of the basic stuff, like the mm -hmm. buttons and what they do. Uh, I used to have buttons that would not buttons, but the app buttons would would move because I would I guess they were in my pocket or whatever, and it felt like someone was touching, and they would move over. But you can set how long you can press before you can move things, and there are third party apps that allow you to literally overhaul what any of the buttons do and what functions uh, you can and cannot access. There you go. That's the benefit of Android. The customization helps you work your way around those those problems. Well, the nice, uh, the good news is that any day now we'll get an announcement for Apple's new iPhone event. 
uh, and the iPhone 12 will solve all these issues. Of course, absolutely, yeah. and bring a whole bundled in Bluetooth wireless headphones, all yeah. of it. Yeah, fingers Yay. crossed. <laughs> Spoiler. Thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. iPhone stories welcome, Android stories welcome. Any tech stories that tickle your fancy, welcome. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We also have a Facebook group. Join it if you haven't already. facebookcom slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right, let's check in with the amateur traveler Chris Christensen, who's back with some news on TripAdvisor's newest and serious filter. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. TripAdvisor is a popular site for finding reviews about hotels. They're adding a new filter, and this one is a little serious. They're basically adding a filter that will let you find which accommodations, restaurants, and tours have had reports of sexual assault, rape, or sexual harassment. They're basically going to flag particular hotels that have safety warnings, but they're going to look at reviews with safety warnings that include rapes, drugging, sexual assault, robberies, and they're researching other safety filters that include if the neighborhood of the hotel is walkable at night or if it has 24 by 7 security. So they were under some pressure to do this, but I think it's a good move on TripAdvisor's part, and so another reason to use them to try and find a safe hotel room, which I think we can all agree we would like. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Yeah, a very serious topic. But when you're staying in a city you're unfamiliar with, you may not realize, you know, where where the riskier areas are, or if a hotel is is just happens to have a risky clientele or something. Yeah. That's yeah, sweet. I have definitely stayed in some hotels where I was like, it wasn't even so much that the hotel was bad, but I was like, oh yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't stay in this area again. Mm, yeah. So, no, yes. I've, I've, I've done the same. Yeah. Uh, Little heads up, never hurt us. Absolutely. In the mailbag today, Carol wrote in about our discussion with Justin Robert Young last Thursday about robocalls and how awful they are. Carol says, I want to tell you about my anti-robocall strategy. I have, I have an Apple Watch to get all my non-call notifications on, so I have my phone set to do not disturb with contacts and still get all those notifications. I call this the nuclear option. I get about one per day average, she's talking about robocalls, over the last month, but even that's too many. They seem to have slowed down for me lately. Yeah. Um, wow. That's an interesting, that's an interesting way of doing that. Um, I, I feel like mine have slowed down too. I bet they're going to pick up as we get closer to the election though, because we're going to get lots of those robocalls. But, oh, yeah. my healthcare robocalls are on a tear right now. I mean, I, I, I definitely, I think I said last, last week was particularly bad. I said something like I was getting five a day. That's probably not the average, but the average is at least three. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I even got them. I, I got two. I got two over the past two weeks when I was out of the country. Mm. Um, and uh, so it was very easy for me to know that they were not calls that I wanted to take because I'm like, no, it'd be calling me right now. Um, so yeah. Well, uh, it's good. usually like, do you know anybody in North Dakota? No. Did they leave a voicemail? No. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't care. Whoever that is didn't care. I will about occasionally enough, you know. see an area code that I don't recognize and I'll look it up. Not because I'm going to answer the phone because I'm like, oh, what, what area code is that? Like, yeah. oh, I have seven one. Nevada. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for writing in, Carol. Uh, always good to, to hear solutions of what's working for our our community and especially our patrons. Thank you to our patrons for making the show what it is. Yes. Our goal each month is to get one more patron than last month, and you could be the person that puts us over the top. Become a DTNS member, get an ad-free RSS feed special episodes from myself on how we do the show. I'll be back to doing those editor's desks this week. Uh, special episodes looking back on the tech news of the past and more. Sign up at patreon.com slash DTNS. And special treat if you're in Austin, Texas. Tomorrow, I will not be on DTNS again. I know, I just got back, but I'm traveling to Austin for the Out of Bounds Comedy Festival uh, to take part in a live night attack with Brian Brushwood and Justin Robert Young. Uh, so come on by and visit. It's downstairs at the Hideout Theater in Austin, Texas. $10 uh, cover charge gets you two openers plus the live night attack as the headliner of that particular section of the comedy festival. Doors open at 8. I think it's running from 8.30 to 10, it says on the website. You can go check it out at oobfest.com. Uh, that's no B at the beginning, just O O B F uh, mm. and see the schedule there. And, uh, hopefully I'll see some of you when we're in Austin. Very cool. 
Got something on your mind? Got a question? Got a comment? Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow. Well, you are. Patrick Beja is. Talk to them tomorrow and I'll see you on Wednesday. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>